Hello, my name is Herman Retana from Incai Business School in Costa Rica. This video is about cloud service and deployment models. We will be talking in this video about infrastructure, platform, and software as a service, which are the service models, and we will also talk about public, private, and hybrid cloud, which are the deployment models. This will also allow us to talk a little bit more about IT as a service, which is the current trend in how IT offerings are out there. And something very important is that this video is not an engineering level video. This video is for business executives and I'm going to be trying to explain all the prior concepts in plain simple English. Something important about the content of this video is that most of it has already been written back in 2011 by the National Institute of Standards and Technology of the US when they wrote their definition of cloud computing. This work by Mel and Grace from back then kind of brought peace in a very lively debate about what was cloud, what was not cloud. How should we define the different flavors and forms that the cloud was taking back in the day? And I'm going to be trying to summarize what they wrote back then in this video. Now, in order to understand the definition of what is cloud, we must first clarify what is not cloud. In this sense, traditionally we have bought IT products and infrastructure from traditional vendors such as IBM, HP, Dell, Sun Microsystems back in the day, and we used to buy hardware from them and we would equip our data centers with all the hardware they would sell us. Even though they could take their hardware and now offer it as a public service, they are not necessarily cloud providers. That being said, the cloud providers will leverage the hardware by these former vendors to offer this same hardware as a service. And they're going to be offering this service to end users and firms like us, which are the consumers of cloud services. Something important is that we're talking about the consumption of a service, not about the acquisition of equipment or products. In order to understand the different service models, it is worthwhile doing a recap of the IT stack, which is basically all the different elements needed for a software application to run. And we will describe them from the bottom up, from the most raw and rudimentary elements, all the way to the software application on top. We start down below with networking and storage. We need to access our application somehow, and our application will be manipulating data that is stored somewhere. This data is going to be manipulated by processing power, which comes in the form of a physical server's hardware. This is where we get the certain number of cores of CPU and certain number of gigabytes of RAM. This is what you use to manipulate the data. Also, this hardware might not necessarily be bare metal hardware, it could be virtualized hardware, in the sense that what we're consuming are the resources from a virtual server, not from a direct physical server. This is done via virtualization software, more formally called hypervisors. And once we have the server running, either physical or virtual server, we install in it on operating system. Most commonly in the server's context, we're gonna be talking about Windows or Linux operating systems, although we also find Unix, Solaris, others around there. Those of you Mac users watching this video, macOS is an operating system that is very common in laptops, but not so much for servers. Now we don't need all the operating system to run an application. We specifically need some runtime environment, some libraries and middleware that are part of the operating system that will enable the application to run. Finally, we need a place where we store and organize the data used by the application. So we're gonna use database engines and we have the business logic or application logic atop, which makes use of all the other elements underneath it in the IT stack. Having clarified this, we can now describe the different cloud service models. And let's imagine a context where we have a given application that is using the entire IT stack, but the client does not want to take care of the underlying hardware. So everything from virtualization downwards, including the physical server and the networking and storage, are all going to be managed by the provider. We only want to care about and worry about all of what goes from the operating system upwards. In other words, we're going to be selecting what kind of operating system we want, and we're going to be selecting on what server capacity we want, but we're going to be the ones accessing the operating system and configuring the application, configuring databases, running everything. Everything from the operating system upwards, we do ourselves. Given that what the provider is doing for us is taking care of the infrastructure, this is what we're going to be calling an infrastructure as a service offering. And quite likely the clients who are going to be accessing these kind of services are system administrators, 
who are used to managing these kind of elements within the data centers of organizations. There are very common examples of infrastructure as a service nowadays. The major player in the market is Amazon Web Services, AWS, with its EC2 offering, or Elastic Compute Cloud. Close competitors are Google with its Google Compute Engine, and Microsoft has its Azure virtual machines there too. All of them offered storage, processing power, and other services related to the bare infrastructure. They also include networking services, load balancers, and other things that, once again, are generally within the scope of what the system administrator will do in a firm. Let's move to a different context. We again have another IT stack, but this time, I don't want to care about the operating system and the runtime. Rather, I want to hand off the management of these to the provider. What I want to do is I want to just take care of running the application, developing it, understanding how its database works, configuring it, and putting it to run. This is a service geared for developers, developers who know how to write code that will run in some runtime, and they want the provider to take care of that runtime. Basically, I want a platform where I can send my software code, my source code, and my source code will run atop the runtime that is offered to me by the provider. Given that I'm sending my code to run on the provider's platform, we're going to be calling this Platform as a Service, which is another very common cloud offering. Good examples of these are Google's App Engine. Amazon Web Services also has Lambda and Elastic Beanstalk, which are Platform as a Service offerings. Mark the Vajour initially was actually entirely a platform as a service where you could run .NET applications. Later down the road, they started supporting applications coded in other languages. And a less known example, but very common to users of Salesforce is Salesforce force.com environment, where basically you can run your code that will integrate with the Salesforce ecosystem. Finally, what if we don't want to care about absolutely anything? Rather, we just want to access the application. In this case, I want the provider to take care of absolutely everything. Since what I'm going to be accessing now is the software itself, I'm going to be calling this software as a service. And this is an offering that is consumed by end users mainly. End users, those of us who really don't care about where our application is running. Let me ask you a question. A good example of software as a service offerings are Google Docs or more closely to it, Gmail, the offering of email service online. How many of you have ever wondered on what operating system the Gmail servers are running? Well, we never asked this question. In fact, we've never even wondered where in the world is our data stored, what operating system is it running, or on what programming language was Gmail coded. We don't care about this, and that's precisely what we want to do. We want to not care about these things. We want all these things to be abstracted from us. We only want to consume the software application. In addition to Google's G Suite, we can also have examples such as Office 365, which is another online Office suite. A flagship product back in the day when the cloud was just starting was Salesforce CRM. That CRM that you can access with just a username and a password on a web page and use an entire CRM system off a web page. That was Salesforce. And we can even find entire ERPs running such as that of NetSuite. So rather than installing our application server and database server locally to run an ERP system, we can use a username and password to access NetSuite online. All of these are examples of software as a service. Another service offering relevant here, which is not a cloud service per se, but does enable the consumption of cloud services, is the offering of cloud brokerage services. What is a cloud broker? A cloud broker is a consultant or someone who helps organizations to consume cloud resources. They are particularly popular in the infrastructure as a service camp where even if we give to a firm 100 servers and tell the firm you can use these 100 servers for free, chances are that firm does not know how to deploy an application across the 100 servers. There's a knowledge gap that it needs to bridge, so cloud brokers can come in and function as bridges that close the gap that impedes initially a firm to consume infrastructure and services. So you can think of that they're going to help us go and start consuming these resources. There are many people who actually make money off this manner in the sense that say, hey, you know that you need a virtual server, I can go and get it for you. And this is the value that they add. 
in between what the traditional infrastructure offering is and what the actual customer needs. It is also common to find them in the platform as a service camp where they help developers start consuming and deploying their applications on platform as a service offerings, though it is much more common to find them on the infrastructure side. Now, given these three service delivery models, we can find some economic relationships between them. For instance, as we move from infrastructure towards platform and finally to software as a service, the provider is doing much more for us in the sense that we care much less about what's going on underneath. In other words, the provider is adding much more value to us. To that extent, as we move from left to right, the value added by the service provider is greater and correspondingly the prices that the provider will charge to us are greater. Conversely, if we move towards the left, we're actually moving towards more standardized and commoditized offerings where prices are going to be much lower. A good way of understanding this is that if we are on the right side, if we are consuming a software application that is already up and running, that will be equivalent to going to a restaurant and ordering food that is already cooked and served. Whereas if we go to the left side, we have to build everything on our own, which would be equivalent to not going to a restaurant, but rather going to the supermarket, choosing our ingredients and putting everything together. Of course, it's going to be much less expensive to eat with the ingredients we bought at the supermarket, but we can only do that if we actually know how to cook our meal. Whereas on the right, we're going to be paying a little more, but we don't have to worry about doing all the cooking. So the different service delivery models are not one better than other. They're just suited for different users. Remember that I told you before that infrastructure offerings were more akin to system administrators, while platforms are for developers who don't want to care about the underlying infrastructure, and software as a service offerings are akin to us users. We don't care about anything of what's going underneath the hood. Now, let me build on that argument that infrastructure as a service offerings are commoditized and standardized. And I'm going to make the argument that the basic infrastructure in its pure form with no extra added values is a commodity, which is not to differentiate it. And I'm going to do this based on the infrastructure offerings history. Many of us think that the infrastructure offerings started with Amazon because they are the largest player in the market. However, before Amazon, back in 2005, in February 2005, Sun Microsystems came with an offering. They realized that their very powerful servers were not selling as well. And they said, well, maybe I don't have to sell the entire hardware, but I can lease the hardware on hourly rates. And they estimated that the total cost of ownership, the TCO for any organization of running their own server was between six and $16 per hour. So they said, well, let's sell this at $1 per hour and everyone's gonna combine it. Their offering did not succeed to a great extent because they were selling everything in a very corporate manner where you had to sign lots of agreements to access their leased environments. But the fact that they started trying to lease harder per hour was already a good signal for the market. A few years later, back in March 2006, Amazon came on with the offering and they launched their simple storage service, their storage service in March 2006, and they launched their EC2 server instance offerings in August 2006. And their price back in the day in August 2006 was merely 10 cents per hour, a tenth of that is Sun Microsystems. Now that was about nine years ago. Nowadays for that same server, and my baseline server here is gonna be a Linux server with two gigs of RAM, costs around 2.3 cents per hour. You can imagine that given these prices, competition could not be too far off. When Rackspace launched its Rackspace Cloud Suite back in October 2008, they started charging 12 cents per hour, slightly above the 10 cents of Amazon, mainly because they offered lots of support along with their servers, but then Amazon cut down prices and Rackspace had to come down to 8 cents too. Also back in the day when Google Compute Engine first came to be, they started charging the same 10 cents as Amazon did. But nowadays that same two and a half gig RAM server is about two and a half cents per hour. Now Google does not offer a two gig RAM server, but that's more or less the equivalent I computed. When Microsoft came to the picture in April, 2013, their announcement said, we're gonna come in and price match all what Amazon is doing in terms of compute, storage, and bandwidth, which was a clear signal that this was a non-differentiated product with a very intense price battle between the top providers. 
Now the maximum expression of any commodity is that it is traded in some clearinghouse in an open market. And even though it was not successful because of security and ownership constraints and concerns of the potential users, SpotCloud was in the market as a clearinghouse for anyone wanting to offer or buy capacity. Now, just to give you a final data point on this, if you go to Amazon, again, the top player, and you dare to pay upfront for three years of usage, you can get that same two gig RAM Linux server for about a single cent per hour. This is how inexpensive it is to consume cloud infrastructure offerings. Now let's move to a different topic and talk about the deployment models. And please remember that the difference between those is going to be based on who owns the hardware. And this will become clear in just a second, but let's start with an example. Let's assume that we're accessing the offering of a public cloud infrastructure provider. What makes it public is that the servers, the virtual hardware is available for anyone in the world. I'm going to be representing here different organizations with different colors. So basically this is an offering where anyone can go in with a credit card and access a virtual server. For any given organization, we actually don't know who our neighbors are. We don't know who other organizations might be making use of the same hardware, the same physical host, which means I'm using a virtual server, which is entirely my own, but my virtual server is hosted in the same environment as many other virtual servers of many other people. And this is what we're going to be calling a public cloud offering. Now let's focus on the red squares of the red organization. Even though this is a single organization, it might be that these servers are actually being used or being allocated for different departments within the organization. And I'm going to represent these departments with letters. These could be different projects, different business units, different departments, different clients within the same organization. Rather than using the public cloud offering, this organization, this red organization could have a given set of hardware that it owns and thus it can offer to its own internal departments in a more private form. In this case, these departments are accessing on-demand hardware that is being offered by the firm's own IT department. But note that since the hardware is exclusively of the given organization, then all departments know that the neighbors, even though they may be other departments, they are all from the same organization. A important nuance here is that even though the hardware is for exclusive use of the organization, this hardware might be in that same organization's data center, or it could be co-located at a third party location, which means I'm actually leasing the hardware, the physical hardware over at a third party's data center. And from here, I am running my on-demand virtual servers, but my neighbors are always going to be members of my same organization. This is what we call a private cloud. Now let's depart from this state where we were with the private cloud and assume that a new project comes in from this same red organization. Let's call this project X and project X starts demanding hardware capacity from the firm to the point in which that hardware capacity is maxed out. And the people in the business unit X or in the project X would like to continue consuming additional resources, but there are no longer any resources available within the firm's private cloud what this given project could do is go to the public offering and start pulling some resources from this public offering. This usage of a public offering for extra demand not available in my data center is what we formally call in the industry as cloud bursting. And it could not only be the project X, the one that is doing this cloud bursting. Project A could go outside too, and so could project D. And when we're combining private cloud with public cloud, this is what gives birth to what we call a hybrid cloud. Now the term hybrid cloud is somewhat ambiguous. In this case, I'm showing you an example of a private cloud with on-demand servers for the internal organization and the public cloud in the same manner on demand. But we could also have static traditional bare metal hardware in a private form and combine this with on-demand public servers and still call this a hybrid environment. What is important is that we're combining hardware that is of exclusive use of my organization with public cloud infrastructure offerings. And these are the three main deployment models. Some people over there also talk about community cloud, which is basically a cloud where my neighbors are from organizations that I know, but that's not really a term that is commonly used in the industry. Now, so far we've spoken a lot about hardware that is offered on demand. We also talked about platform and software on demand. 
But overall, the entire IT industry is shifting to this thinking of IT offered as a service. And let me give you some examples of these. For instance, when going into cloud infrastructure offerings, the providers quickly realized that many clients would go into these offerings and the first thing they would do is install a relational database management engine. Well, rather than having customers to spin up their own database engines, cloud providers quickly realized that they could actually offer the relational database service and offerings such as Amazon's RDS, relational database service, Oracle's cloud database, or Microsoft Azure SQL database are database offerings that we can go directly to the cloud and start running SQL queries against them without worrying about the underlying operating system installing or configuring the database engine. We just go and run queries against these available databases. By the way, I am mentioning these three examples because they're the ones that were highlighted by Forrester's Database as a Service Wave 2017 report. Also, infrastructure providers noted that some clients were going to the cloud to start deploying containers. Containers are this new way of organizing application architectures where we don't port virtual systems altogether. We only manipulate and port and move from one place to another the minimum elements we need to run an application, which means I'm going to be porting the application, the database, and the runtime, but not the operating system underneath. Well, Amazon CES Container Elastic Service, Azure containers are public offerings for us to deploy containers. We can also use Docker's data center and Google Kubernetes to run containers in virtual environments. Once again, these are all being offered as a service. Another interesting type of offering in the cloud has been that of BI as a service or business intelligence as a service. And business intelligence is a very nice use case for the cloud because running the reports, running the analysis of BI's engines traditionally requires a vast amount of computing power, but only for a short period of time while we crunch all the data. After that, it is not so much processing intensive. So it's a very good use for the cloud. And what providers like Tableau with their Tableau online offering and Microsoft with their Power BI offering have done is offer customers the possibility of doing all their analysis and visualizations online and access them via a web browser or a mobile app. And finally, one of the most recent yet cool offerings is artificial intelligence as a service. We can go online, connect to Amazon service and use Lex for natural language processing use Polly to understand speech and use the recognition service to understand what different images are. IBM also within their Blue Mix cloud catalog has a large number of APIs from their Watson machine available to us. Some of these examples are conversation, which enables us to very easily build chatbots that understand natural language. They also of course have the corresponding text to speech and speech to text APIs. They also have a visual recognition API to which we can send images and receive input on what the image is. Finally, they also have a very cool discovery API that allows us to send them data and Watson is going to be discovering patterns and reporting them to us. Google's artificial intelligence and Azure machine learning APIs are also equally impressive and they're all available out there for us to consume as a service. And this is the nice way in which IT is evolving. We don't have to invest in the resources and buy upfront all the different hardware assets as we did before. We can consume infrastructure, platforms, software as a service, and all these other IT as a service offerings I have shown you here, all as a service, which means we are paying for them as we need them as we go on a pay as you go basis. With this, I conclude my video about cloud service and deployment models. And my hope is that now your vision of the cloud is much wider and you now have some ideas of the different opportunities that this will bring to you as an end user and perhaps more importantly to your firms you work for. Thank you very much.